I seem to have misplaced my bulletin. Um, do you have one, Bill? Let us worship the Lord together in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 13. We read, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Let us sing of our Lord Jesus Christ as one who fulfills these words, Psalm 110, and we sing the whole of the psalm to the tune, London New. Psalm 110, the Lord did say unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes a stool whereon thy feet may stand. So our Lord Jesus is exalted. And then if you look at the end of the The psalm, the glorious, verse 5, the glorious and mighty Lord that sits at thy right hand shall in his day of wrath strike through kings that do him withstand. He's coming as an almighty king, a man of war to engage his enemies and utterly destroy them. Psalm 110, the whole psalm, the tune is London New.
stand to seek the Lord in prayer. O Lord God, most high, he who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, the one who hath immortality, life in himself, a God who is blessed forever, in need of nothing, we come to bring our worship unto thee. It is our duty and privilege, and as we exalt your holy name in this world, we know that it does not add anything to your intrinsic glory. But yet it is our great privilege to remember the name of our God, and to meditate upon all thy works, and to rejoice in that great salvation that has been wrought through our Lord Jesus the one who humbled himself, who was found in fashion as a man, who took upon him the form of a servant and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And yet we have sung of him in an exalted state when for a reward of his obedience, the Father said unto the Son, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And we know that he does reign and shall reign until this great promise is fulfilled. That you made him, along with us, a little lower than the angels, but yet he is crowned with glory and honor. You set him over all the works of your hands. We praise you that he is the Almighty King, the King of glory, King of kings, Lord of lords, Prince over the kings of the earth, that he has prevailed to open the book and to unloose the seven seals thereof, so that the history of our present providence is being effected by the sovereign power of our Redeemer. We join with the chorus of heaven, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He is worthy of all praise and honor and riches and glory and blessing even forevermore. And Lord, we ask that our hearts would be opened today to love him and to esteem him and to rejoice in him as the pearl of great price and the beloved of our soul that should one ask us, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? We, we would not be searching for an answer. My beloved is white and ruddy. He is the chief among 10,000 uh, to my soul. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. And if we are found here this day unconscious of his presence, that we know where to find him, that we would go forth uh, to the shepherds of the flock, and there we would feed our souls. O oh God, we ask that through the life of a historical character, we would see uh, the duty that lies upon us, but more than that, that we would see Jesus, the one who is supreme, far greater than any of the acts of his servants in this world. And while we look to them and learn to follow them as they followed Christ, yet our ultimate aim is to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Give us patience to wait for the Lord's return from heaven and comfort us in all of our afflictions. Give perseverance to thy people because he that endureth to the end shall be saved. We ask, O God, that you would Give us physical strength for worship. We are weary in body and mind, but you can quicken us. Give us spiritual strength to worship, that you would revive the hearts of your people, commanding their strength for this warfare of worship. We pray for the dead, O God, those who sit here clock-watching, 
may be wanting to be somewhere else. Those who have come into the, the church with a twist in their spirit. Those who come with all kinds of excuses, arming themselves as with a shield. Oh God, penetrate the shield. Break down the walls. Straighten out the will. Humble the heart. Convince of sin, O oh God. Take them up in the almighty hand of the Spirit and shake them to the core of their being that all of their defenses would be broken down, all of their ignorance would be shattered, and that they would be enlightened in their minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that stubborn, selfish will would be turned around to the point they have no idea what's going on, but make them new creatures in Christ. O oh Lord our God, tarry with us then, and exalt the name of our beloved Redeemer, as we pray unto thee in his name. Amen. Our consecutive reading this afternoon brings us to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. Paul writes again to the church. There's a variety of reasons for that. One of the main reasons is that they've misunderstood his first letter. And so we have a New Testament church that gets apostolic revelation and yet trips up over it. We shouldn't imagine that we're too different from them. And so we constantly need to be instructed in the Word of God. But Paul addresses this pastorally for their encouragement and also their correction. As we read chapter 1, I want you to notice the connection between patience and endurance and the hope of the return of the Lord Jesus. We heard a wonderful lecture on this from Mr. Evans on Thursday evening at our colloquium, uh, but it did strike me reading through this chapter that the two things, they come together again, as they do in many places in the Bible. How do we endure? Well, we have a hope set before us, the way Christ did that he despised the shame, and he had his eye upon the reward that the Father had set before him. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing which with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, there were problems here in the church. They hadn't understood what Paul had, had been teaching them, especially about the second coming. And so they took the suddenness of Christ's coming to mean the imminence of Christ's coming, and so much so that some of them had stopped working. And he addresses that later. 
and tells them, you better stop that. You need to get on with your lives and be faithful to the Lord. The person who will not work will not eat. But yet it's interesting, though he writes a letter of correction, he commends them. Sometimes when we correct, the only thing that we see is the problem. And we want to wade in and tell the person everything that's wrong. But this is a church in which there's a lot right. And that's apparent from this opening chapter. So take, for example, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So they've got a problem understanding the second coming, but yet their faith is growing, and their love is abounding. This is a growing church with a problem. I don't think you could show me any church in the history of the world, even growing churches that don't have problems. Sometimes we can focus on the problem and we miss what is good and what is encouraging. It's also evident that they are standing strong in the midst of tribulation because he focuses upon that and he recognizes the temptation to struggle. They're being persecuted. He uses the word tribulation, verse 6. Then he speaks of trouble at the end of the same verse. But yet he says in verse 4 that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions. I rejoice in you. And your endurance in a very difficult position, other congregations of the Lord's people are saying, do you hear what's going on in Thessalonica? Our brethren are struggling. But the remarkable thing is they're flourishing. They haven't given up. They haven't surrendered. They're enduring in the strength and in the grace of the Lord Jesus. But now he encourages them in a different way in their tribulation. Not only is the Lord giving you grace to endure, but I want you to look at the end, he says, and understand this, that God is a righteous judge. And God is going to recompense those who trouble you, and he's also going to recompense those of you who are troubled. I don't think we take enough encouragement from the last judgment. Now, that can be hard. We want sinners to be saved in the world. We're to love our enemies. But we have to be sensitive to the language of Scripture. What is the encouragement of the church here? To those who are troubled, rest. And what are you to rest in? That the Lord Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven with mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Brethren, that is to be an encouragement to the hearts of Christians. Now, we're not to be personally vindictive. We're not to hate people in a sinful way. But we are to rejoice in the vindication of God and his church and the destruction of those who have persecuted the church and remained resolute in their opposition from God. Christ is going to come in vengeance and cast them into hell. We're sensitive that when we say that, some of those enemies will be found in the church itself. And so you have Christians here today and you're wrestling and you've got afflictions and troubles and, and, and you find it hard to go on. And Paul's saying, God is giving you grace to endure. He will continue to do so. But you have to have recompense to the end or you have to have respect to the end. God is going to deal with all those who trouble you and he will trouble them eternally in hell. But there are those of you here today and this is your end. I ask you to pay attention to it. Who are these people? Paul does not articulate their sins. He doesn't say, 
They're the people who have persecuted you in this way. They've lied against you. They've lifted up the sword against you. They're trying to get you into prison and, 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 and other things. Though all of that might be true, how does he describe them? They are, they are those who know not God and obey not the gospel. Well, you're here today and you know about God and you know about the gospel, but you do not know God by faith in Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter how many times the gospel has been preached to you. If I were to open this pulpit to you in a sense, there are some of you here and you could have a good stab at preaching the gospel. You could tell people what the gospel is. But here's your enmity. You have not obeyed the gospel. What does that mean for you eternally? Well, I repeat, you are going to meet the Lord Jesus Christ when he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance upon you. And you are going to be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. What a thing. That you will go to hell from the church with all of the persecutors of the church. Will you think about that today? Is it not time to think about that? For your disobedience of the gospel for 10, 20, 30, I don't know how many years. This is your end. If we were able to tattoo your eyes so it became a filter and you looked at the world through this truth, oh, it would be a mercy to you. But what of the Christian? You're to take encouragement that God will deal with his enemies thus. But more than that, you're to take encouragement for your continual endurance that on that same day which is a day of destruction to the wicked it will be a day of salvation to you verse 10 when he shall come the same day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in them that believe is that not a remarkable thing we think and rightly so that on that day christ is going to be the admiration of the world we will admire him and of course we will but that's not what Paul says here. Paul says Christ will be admired, but one of the ways he will be admired is in you. A church in Thessalonica who have held firm in the midst of all of their trials and tribulations, that when the, when the devil unleashed persecution against them to try and destroy them, the grace of the Almighty Christ upheld them and they persevered in grace as a testimony to him and there they stand on that day a little church with the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ and they sealed through seas of blood and they walked through fire and water and the Lord has brought them into a wealthy place and it's like the father says, look at the glory of my son, but here's a way you can see how wonderful a redeemer he is. Admire him. In all of these little pipsqueak Christians that he sustained in the strength of his grace and glorified himself in. That's our end, brethren. We will see him and we will admire him but he will be admired in us as the one who saved us from beginning to end. You walk in the midst of trouble. More trouble is coming, okay? More trouble is coming. But there's strength in Christ to persevere for his glory. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let us sing in Psalm 39. Psalm 39. It 
says we're singing verse 8 to 8. I doubt that. Psalm 39, verse 1 through 8. The tune is St. Mary. I said, I will look to my ways, lest with my tongue I sin. Verse 1 through 8, Psalm 39.
us turn in God's Word to 1 Chronicles chapter 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 11, and we will read there from the beginning, verse 1 through 25. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David unto Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king to Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. And David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went first up and was chief. And David dwelt in the castle, therefore, castle, therefore they called it the city of David. And he built the city round about, even from Milo round about, and Joab repaired the rest of the city. So David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom, and with all Israel, to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And this is the number of the mighty men whom David had, Jashubim, a Hachmanite, the chief of the captains. He lifted up his spear against three hundred slain by him at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, who was of the three mighties. He was with David at Pastamim, and there the Philistines were gathered together to battle, where was a parcel of ground full of barley, and the people fled from before the Philistines. And they set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. Now three of the thirty captains went down to the rock to David, into the cave of Adullam, and the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Raphaim. And David was then in the hold, and the Philistines' garrison was then at Bethlehem. And David longed and said, O oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. And the three break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. But David would not drink of it, but poured it out to the Lord, and said, My God forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? For with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mightiest. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, he was chief of the three. For lifting up his spear against three hundred, he slew them, and had a name among the three. Of the three, he was more honorable than the two, for he was their captain. Howbeit, he attained not to the first three. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among three mighties. Behold, he was honorable among the thirty, but attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. 
Amen. Please stand for prayer. O oh Lord, we ask that you would hear us in this our day, this our time of need, that you would send help from above, even out of your sanctuary, from Zion, your own holy hill. Give help to us. Some trust in horses and others in chariots, but we are determined to remember the name of the Lord. So gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O glorious King Jesus, and ride forth in the preaching of your word as a mighty man of war to subdue every heart in this place unto yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I had the privilege many years ago now, I was thinking of the date. It was 2009, 15 years passed so quickly. But I had the privilege on my first visit to the family conference of doing some historical touring. And Mr. Isbell took me to Princeton. And there in Princeton, as you walk through the hall of the college, you have portraits of past professors and principals. The Hodges are there, Charles and Archibald, Alexander. And then you have B.B. Warfield. You have monuments to their faithful service. And then you go there, from there, to the graveyard, where lies Jonathan Edwards, Archibald Alexander, Samuel Davies, Samuel Miller, together with those that I've already mentioned. All with memorials written on their headstones, mainly in Latin. If you're not acquainted with these men, you, you should become acquainted with them. But if you are acquainted with them, knowing what they accomplished, you understand that you get the sense that you're walking among giants. In 1 Chronicles chapter 11, it's like we're walking through an Old Testament hall of fame. The chapter begins with the people gathering to Hebron after Saul's death. They declare David king, and they anoint him before making a march on what would become Jerusalem. They take that city from the Jebusites. They storm the stronghold of Zion, which then becomes the seat of David's reign. And then from there, he will expand and consolidate his kingdom, bringing his enemies into subjection to him, like the Lord Jesus Christ does, the greater David in the New Testament. The Philistines, the Edomites, the Moabites, they all come under the yoke of Israel's king. And then we come to verse 10. And like its parallel passage in 2 Samuel chapter 23, God takes us on a walk through the great hall in the king's palace where there are portraits of eminent soldiers and David's mighty men. They stand faithful to him and they engage in the fight to establish the kingdom of Israel. If you add them up, there are, I believe, 37 in all. They're ordered in rank of valor and exploits. The first is Jashabim, then Eliezer, next Shammah. These, we're told, are among the first three. And then we have a second group of three. Abishai, the brother of Joab, who kills 300, is among them. And then the character that we want to study today. From verse 22 of chapter 11 through verse 25, we are told of one by the name Benaiah. Look at verse 22. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, 
the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts. We want to consider this significant biblical character. Uh, when we called our son Benaiah, it was interesting how many people in the church asked us, where would you get that name from? We need to become more acquainted with your Bible. This is a significant man in the history of David and in the history of Solomon. Consider in the first place that he is built by his God. He is built by his God. You know that names in the Bible are significant. And they're significant in at least three ways. The first would be that they express a recognition of God. That God had given the child. So you could think, for example, of Samuel. He is asked of God. God gives the desire of a woman for this child. You could think of Nathaniel, which means the gift of God. It's a recognition that we are dependent upon the gift of God for our children. So it's a recognition of God in giving us children. Secondly, they often reveal parents' desires for the life of the child. And so you have Joseph, and that's his father looking at the gift of this son and saying, God will add. God will add to him. God will add to the covenant people through him. And a third way in which names are significant is by being a declaration of what God would do or use that individual for. So consider some of the names of the prophets. You have Isaiah, and it means that the Lord will save. And did we not consider this morning a prime example of that in his ministry? Look unto me, all ends of the earth, and be saved. Well, when we consider Benaiah, he could be all three. But I would say he gets his name especially from his parents' desire for him, and providentially, God's declaration about him. Because God is working through all of our thoughts and decisions in life, having predestined all things that come to pass. So we're not just bound by what the parents' desire was. God is doing something through that desire himself. The name Benai in Hebrew is really the product of two words. Bana is the verb that means to build. And the A-H ending refers to the name Jehovah, which when you bring them together, Benaiah simply means Jehovah built. Built up by the Lord. Established by God. Well, from a parent's perspective, is this not the desire that every one of us ought to have? And in providence, can you not see that God is fitting him with a name that he will demonstrate in his life? But what he becomes is a man whom God sets apart and establishes in grace to use for his service. Might I say at this point that unless this was true of him, and indeed unless this is true of you, your life will never amount to any real, lasting, eternal worth. Oh, you might be successful in business, you might be popular among men, but when that great day comes, no lasting, eternal worth. Mr. Law has been preaching this to you from the book of Ecclesiastes, you look at the whole of life. I seek after women, I seek after wine, I seek after wisdom, and I hate my life. Why? Because apart from Christ, it doesn't matter what you have or what you attain to. It's vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Imagine having a name like this and coming to an end like that. Imagine spending your life industriously building wood, hay, and stubble, and it's all going to burn at the last day. 
and you go to hell with a biblical name. He's built by his God. Well, brethren, that's the way it must be. Psalm 127, verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord keep the city, the watchman watches but in vain. Except the Lord establish your family, all of your attempts to establish your family yourself will be vain and futile and painful. Except the Lord establish your life, the whole of your life will be vanity and pain. In this sense, we all need to be spiritually benias. We need God in his grace to pull us out of the mire of sin and set our feet firmly upon Jesus Christ or the whole of our life is a sinful and provocative waste of time before Almighty God. I want to speak to you children. You all have different names. There's only one of you here today who carries this name. But your parents, very likely, because they love the Lord, they thought long and hard about that name. And they prayed over it. There's some of you called Josiah. Jehovah helps. This godly, reforming king of Judah that turned the covenant nation back to God. Why do you think your parents called you Josiah? Just because they liked the name? No, because they desire that this would characterize your life. We have two Micahs, one male, one female. The meaning is the same. Who is like the Lord? A God who is incompatible in mercy, pardoning iniquity. Oh, that we had that in our hearts, that the whole of our days we live to praise him. Who is like unto thee, O God? We have promise. Because promise is so significant, the ground of all of our hopes all of the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. We have Ethan, which means permanence or solidity. And he's one of the sweet psalmists of Israel. We have Hannah, which means grace or favor. The mother of Samuel, the great prophet of Israel. And we have Benaiah, built by the Lord. Don't you see? Your parents have given you this name for a reason, but your name by its meaning cannot save you, nor the hopes of your parents who prayerfully gave you that name. You have to be built here for yourself. And then a word to parents. You come together in marriage. God opens the womb. As far as we view that naturally, you have an ability to bring children into the world. And you can choose these names with earnest desires in your heart. But you can't do this. Can you? You can't do this. You cannot establish your children in grace. Some of those who are older than me, you know this too well. You've watched the carnage of children turn aside from the truth and you brought them up the same way as you brought the others up and you prayed for them the way that you, you, you prayed for the other children. You're helpless as you watch the career. But yet in another sense, we spend a lot of time thinking about feeding our children healthy foods, not letting them touch plastics, and worrying about what fabrics they wear upon their body, how we're going to educate them, what jobs we're going to get. And in the midst of all that, the main thing can so easily pass you by. 
I warn some of you younger families, may God burn it in your heart. The time flies. And the main things can so easily be buried under the mundane. That heart yearning, that sincere cry unto God, that your children should be built by grace and established for eternity. There is not enough parental yearning for that in the church of the Lord Jesus. It's good as parents to see these deeds that Benaiah performs, and we'll see them later, but they're only praiseworthy insofar as his name was a gracious reality in his life. He's founded upon God. His goal is the glory of God. O oh God, we cry, will you not build my children upon this rock? He's built by the Lord. Secondly, he's taught by his dad. He's taught by his dad. There are five men called Benaiah in the Bible, but this one is by far the most notable. And you'll see how he is distinguished in verse 22 by his father. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts. Kabzeel is in the south of Judah. Jehoiada was among those who gathered themselves to David, and we know that he's a key man in the priestly family of Aaron. In fact, if you look at a later chapter, chapter 27 and verse 5, he is named among the chief of the priests. So Benaiah has a chief priestly family aligned with the household of David. His own name, Jehoiada, comes from two Hebrew words meaning Jehovah knows. But the emphasis in verse 22 of our chapter is on his valor and the acts that he himself had done. Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel who had done many acts. This is the pedigree of Benaiah's household. Now we will come to the acts of Benaiah, but I want you to see this. He's carrying on a family tradition of valor. He's carrying on a family tradition of valor. Now, as I said, we are totally dependent upon the grace of God to establish our children in the faith. But that is not the same thing, brethren, as believing that somehow it's all of God's grace divorced from anything that you do in the nurture and admonition of your children. God works through you. We can't simply leave it to God. Meanwhile, leave our children to, to find out their own way in this world. No, you as a parent are to show them the reality of grace. You as a father and a mother are to let them know what God requires of them and all of the blessings and the promises that he holds out to them. You are to indoctrinate your children's minds in these things. And then you are to show them what faithful, diligent, courageous service to Christ actually looks like. You're to be characterized by Christian valor. Remember, going to primary or, as you would call it, elementary school, and we would have assembly in those days and there were certain songs that we sang and one of them I had no idea what it was until I grew up and became a Christian he who would valiant be against all disaster 
Let him with constancy follow the master. It's Bunyan, isn't it? Pilgrim's progress. And there we were, even as children, totally ignorant I was of the gospel. And yet, the calling of the Christian life was right there in front of me. Would you be valiant? Would you be as Jehoiada in this chapter, who himself is described as a man of valor in Israel? Would you desire children to be valiant in the ways of the Lord Jesus? So many parents, we want this, don't we, as a theory. Nice idea, of course, we want intellectually our children to be valiant servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you want sons and daughters like Benaiah, then you must commit your all to God to live as Jehoiada. This is still the principle. You teach your children. You show, the, show them how to live. You inspire them to great deeds for Christ by being a living example before their eyes so that your children look at you. And if they have a summary statement about you, it could be something like this. I know my parents seek first the kingdom of God. It seems that nothing else even matters to them. You desire your children to be holy. Be a model of holiness to your children. Show them what it is to hold the line without compromise. Show them what it is to courageously battle with sin and say no, even though the world is entirely against you. Show them what it is to be a parent who is focused upon the word of God and who are men and women of prayer. Professor John Murray, whom you may know, a Scots theologian who came to America, was in the OPC, taught in Westminster Seminary. In his old age, having met, as you could imagine, many of the great men of his own day, he was asked, who was the greatest Christian you ever met, Mr. Murray? Do you know what he answered? My father. A simple crofter from around Dornoch in Scotland. A man who was consistent. A man who was godly. A man who lived a simple godly life before him. And his son went places that the father never went and met people that the father never knew. And yet the son in his old age couldn't get the consistent example of his father out of his mind. You want your children to be diligent. Don't model laziness. Don't talk the talk without walking the walk. Don't teach your children to make your excuses, but show them how a man devoted to God and motivated by something greater than the world is willing to sacrifice to accomplish things for Christ. You want your sons to do exploits for God. Teach them carefully, diligently, and experientially. You listen to Joel Beakey, he talks about this all the time. He talks about his father. If anything, he and his siblings knew about their father was that their father loved the Lord and his, their father was chiefly concerned for their spiritual well-being. He remembers Lord's Day afternoons where the father would sit the children down and read through the pilgrim's progress with tears in his eyes, pressing the spiritual lessons upon each and every one of his children. None of this gar guarantees the conversion of any one of our children. You can do it all, 
and they may turn to their own wicked way, but you must do it still. Benaiah means built by God. But how does God build? He builds through you. Benaiah is built by God. He's taught by his dad. Thirdly, Benaiah is known for his acts. He finds a place in this role of honor. And there are three actions described in verse 22 and following. The first is he kills two Moabite heroes. Verse 22, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Two lion-like men of Moab. We're not told when or where he did this, but we are given the description of the Moabite men he encountered, men who are evidently known to be brave and courageous and fierce in battle. Children, have you ever heard the name Richard the Lionheart? Have you? Who was he? He was a king of England, but his his mom and dad didn't call him Richard the Lionheart. He got that name because of his courage leading the battle in the Crusades. Richard the Lionheart. Well, here are two Moabitish men who, like Richard, have the nickname Lionheart. Moab's best men. Not just one of them, but two of them. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, conquers the lion-like men of Moab. Second, he killed a lion. Not just lion-like men. Now he's actually engaging lions. Look at verse 22. Also he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. You think, well, that might not sound too, uh, too hard to do, the lions in a pit after all. But you need to understand what this image is conveying. First of all, it's a time of snow. It's the middle of winter. What do you think lions would feel like in the middle of winter? Pretty hungry. There's not a lot to eat. And so this lion likely came down into the village. You can imagine the frenzy. If you've seen it in Africa, maybe on a YouTube clip, a lion comes in and all the people are running for their lives out of their little villages can picture the frenzy. And somehow this lion ends up trapped somewhere in the village. And Benaiah saves the people by actually getting into the pit with the lion. He fights it, he kills it, and he nullifies the danger. Now here's the question, children and young people. Would you get into the pit with the lion? No, probably not. Benaiah kills this lion in a pit in a snowy day. And then he kills a giant Egyptian, verse 23. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. This is a Goliath-like individual here, not Not a Philistine this time, but an Egyptian. He's seven and a half feet high. And he has a spear like a flagpole. And Benaiah only has a wooden staff. So Benaiah, somewhat like David, he's outgunned. But yet in the strength of the Lord... With his staff, he disarms the giant Egyptian, takes his spear, and then destroys him with his own weapon. So two of Moab's finest lion-like men, then a lion itself, then a giant Goliath-like Egyptian. But there's more. 
We can't go into all the details, but you should read 1 Kings chapter 2, and you'll discover that he kills the enemies of Israel's king. He kills the enemies of Israel's king. He becomes a kind of royal hitman. We're told here he becomes captain of the guard. Who do you want to go and fix a problem? Where's Benaiah? So David dies, Adonijah tries to take the throne instead of Solomon. Benaiah fixes it. Joab has revolted in the past against David, and David has not acted, but that does not mean judgment will not come. Solomon is establishing the kingdom. Joab needs to be dealt with. Who are you going to send? Send Benaiah. Joab runs in, you remember, and he hangs on trying to, to make a plea. Oh, you'll not kill me in the sanctuary. He takes hold of the altar. Benaiah says, no, die you will. And die he did. And then you have Shimei who cursed David. And Solomon gives him an offer of peace with conditions. Stay here. Don't go outside the limits. Shimei won't do that. Guess who Solomon sent? He sends Benaiah. Now it all sounds very violent, doesn't it? But you have to understand the context. All of these people had opposed the messianic throne of David. They were threats to the establishment and continuance of the kingdom of God. And when Solomon needed it sorted out, he sends Benaiah to execute judgment for the preservation of the church of God. He's known for his acts. Well then, as we move to a close, what can you learn from the life of Benaiah? Well, the first thing is you have to see a shadow of a greater Benaiah. You have to see the Lord Jesus Christ. He's seen in all of these heroes who, like Benaiah, are termed mighty men or men of valor. And they, in their own way, foreshadow the Lord Jesus who comes as a man of war. A man of war. He comes as a savior, that is true, to save his people from their sins. But didn't we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that he comes as a judge to destroy every single one of his enemies? so that in his conquest, his people might rejoice. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. And we will read there verse 10 through 13. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Let the wilderness and the cities lift, their off, lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. Why? Why all of this jubilation and praise? This is the first servant song. This is messianic in its context. Why all of the praise? Verse 13, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. That's the same word. A gibor. A mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. And every one of the giborim, the mighty men in the Old Testament, who served under David, actually point to one who is greater than David. The Lord Jehovah himself, God who is spirit, and yet is a man of war. It is this man of war that fights for you in all of your battles, Christian. The battle is yours, that is true, but ultimately the battle is his, and he gives you the strength to fight. But as you think of that strength, you need to actually think of yourself and what it is to be a Christian. Because this man of war actually gives you an identity. Are you not to be like Christ? You say, of course. 
Well, then you were to be like Christ in this. You are to be a mighty man or woman, a a, a man or woman of valor, a man of war whom he commissions to go forth and fight the good fight of faith. You need to see Christ here and yourself in your identity with him. When you do, not only will you see see a shadow of Christ, you will then receive a stimulus to conquer. You see it, don't you, in Benaiah's relationship to David and the coming of the kingdom in the Old Testament. He, He is a man here who is totally devoted to the kingdom of God. All of his acts of valor are toward establishing that kingdom, preserving that kingdom. Well, here you are today, and you are born into the church and the kingdom of Christ. But many who are so born turn out to be more like the sons of Ephraim who turn back in the day of battle. And those sons of Ephraim, I'd almost guarantee you, they all had names of religious significance, and many of them were given those names with the prayerful hopes of their parents. But what happened? They grew up to surrender to the world and the flesh and the devil. Covenant children do this. The most ridiculous thing about it is they tell themselves that in some way they are being brave and courageous in doing it. And the world gets alongside them and tells them the same thing. Come with us. We will do you good. Forget about your parents. Oh, your parents are weird. You've got parental issues. You need to be brave. You need to break out of that parental mold. You need to follow us. Yeah, you need to follow us doing what everyone else in the world is doing. That costs you absolutely nothing. No courage whatsoever involved. But standing as an island in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, that requires courage, which these covenant children don't have. It's easy to go with the flow of the river, isn't it? It takes a little bit more strength to swim upstream. But they don't have it. In the name of being bold, courageous, and strong, they're weaklings. You surrender to the lion. You're conquered by the word, world, And any courage is false courage. Like the man who goes to the bottle to cry and get that which is not genuine. I said it before and I'll say it again. Imagine meeting God with a name like this and a life like that. Imagine standing before God and he calls you by your name, Benaiah, or he calls you by your name, Josiah, or he calls you by your name, Hannah, or he calls you by your name, Promise. And yet, you've rejected a promise. You haven't cast yourself upon God's grace. You haven't looked to the Lord to be your help. And your life has been built upon sand. Benaiah confronts you with your baptismal call to spiritual warfare under Christ. And you are enlisted in his covenant as a soldier in the army of the king. You have no choice in that, children. You're born. You're born into the status of a Christian soldier. What 
treachery then to turn back in the day of battle. We know this ourselves from history, that those who deserted were justly shot because they deserted their brothers in arms. They deserted everybody back home who was sacrificing for them in the war. They, they deserted uh, or they committed treachery against their, their king and their country. But what is desertion in the American Civil War in comparison to desertion in the army of the Lord? Worse, what is it when soldiers of the King of Kings switch sides and collaborate with the enemy against Christ? Shooting, shooting is too good for you. Hell will be the end. No, you look at this, and you need to receive a stimulus to conquer. As Benaiah fought the Egyptian, the Moabite, and the lion, you are called with spiritual weapons to fight the world and the flesh and the devil and to engage as Benaiah. Everything that sets itself against God, everything that endangers your soul, everything that threatens the prosperity of the kingdom of God. Wouldn't it be something if our children grew up and there's a problem, a real problem, in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, enemies are coming in to attack the church, and you need a fixer, and you say, that man, that woman, they'll stand in the gap. They'll engage the enemy. They'll contend with the lion-like men of Moab. Moab. They won't run from the seven, uh, seven and a half foot Egyptian. They won't flee the village when the lion comes. They'll get in the pit to fight the lion with their bare hands. Most of the time, if you note this, Benaiah is the underdog. He's outnumbered, he's outgunned, or he's dwarfed. And yet every time he wins. Every time he wins. It's like Joshua chapter 23, verse 10, isn't it? Joshua chapter 23, verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. He lived up to his name. Are you living up to yours? Benaiah tells you to build your life on Christ, to put yourself in his hands, to serve courageously against all odds and in the strength of Christ, you may be able to accomplish what you imagine is impossible. Stand, please, for prayer. O oh Lord God and Father in heaven, press these truths deeply upon our soul as parents and children, that Christian children in this congregation would live up to their names by grace, that you would be their help, that you would be gracious to them, that you would give them permanence and endurance in the Christian life, that you would build them by the Lord, that those children whom you have given us, who are yours, as we give them back to you, O oh Lord, be merciful, we pray. Help them to see the fight. Help them to realize the lies of the world. Help them to see that there's no difficulty 
and going with the flow. But the scriptures are so clear, come ye out from among them, be ye holy, separate yourselves unto the gospel, and live for Christ when the world despises you. And in the end, everlasting honor will be yours. Lord, make us all spiritual benayas, ever increasingly build us by your mighty power. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing in Psalm 91, verse 13, to the end, to the tune, St. Stephen. Psalm 91. Thirteen, to the end, upon the adder thou shalt tread, and on the lion strong, thy feet on dragons trample shall, and on the lion's young. The tune is St. Stephen. benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.